And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with tonight's program. So one thing I wanted to do to start with is uh, some of you may be aware of this, others not. But for those of you who are interested in kind of what some of the predictions are coming in the future from a cattle market standpoint and from agriculture commodities in general, uh, the place I will typically look at and direct people to is the Food and Agricultural Policy Institute from the University of Missouri. Uh, one thing I like about their market outlooks is they'll actually show you their past outlooks, plus they keep those uh, some of those online so you can go back and look. Uh, but if you'll just Google uh, F-A-P-R-I and then the word Missouri, you'll get their website up. Now you do want to notice they do an outlook for Missouri specifically, but then they do a U.S. outlook, and that U.S. outlook is what most people would be interested in. And the next couple of slides here, I'm just going to show you a few uh, screen grabs from their outlook. So this first one here is looking at the price uh, projections of feeder steers and fed steers. And just as a reminder, when we're talking about a fed steer, that's a steer coming out of the feedlot that's going to the packing plant to be slaughtered. Um, and so we're talking about steer typically weighing 1,300 to 1,450 pounds there. When we're talking about a feeder steer, that is a steer ready to go in the feed lot. And typically in today's industry, we're thinking about a steer weighing eight to 850 pounds, but, but generally 800 pounds. I know that doesn't mean all cattle need to be that weight before they go to the feed lot, because we'll send them sooner than that definitely. But when you see price reports and feeder steers, we're, we're talking about that 800 pound steer there generally. So they can kind of, they show you some past prices. And if you look back here and everybody uh, remembers these days when the prices were really high, one important thing to remember back then is we were very low on the number of cows out there. And so we had less calves. And so the su supply demand situation really drove those markets up as we kept report more replacement females back and we increased the size of that cow herd, you can see those drop in prices on the feeder steer side of things as well on the fed steer side of things and kind of see where we've been the last several years. And then these would be their projections moving forward. Now they're pretty bullish, uh, especially for this coming year. I'm gonna tell you personally, I'm, I'm not as bullish as what they are. Um, and, and my hesitancy there is we still have a lot of cows out there. Plus, it looks like grain prices are going to be pretty high. And anytime grain prices go high, that tends to put pressure back down on feeder steers and stocker steers and heifers uh, that we're marketing. So those are their projections. Just be aware they don't have a crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball. So you need to kind of plan accordingly. Uh, that we don't know exactly what this market's going to do. And there's a lot of unknown variables out there yet. This is putting it in a little more detail. So this is a screenshot from one of their pages where they'll show you kind of what they're predicting the number of beef cows to be for the next 10 years, the number of cattle on feed, uh, imports and exports, and then prices. And on prices for a stocker calf, they're looking at um, a six to 650 pound animal. They're, they're calling it a feeder steer there, but that, that's really a stocker calf. So just make sure anytime you're looking at these price projections, you make sure you pay attention to what weight animal that is for. And then they're predicting returns as well. And you can see those returns range anywhere from about $18 uh, per cow calf pair up to a, a high of about 160 there, but realize there's a ton of variation from producer to producer. Some producers are making money, some producers are, are breaking even, and there's plenty of them that are losing money. Um, so with that, I wanted to get kind of more into the nuts and bolts of what we want, what I wanted to talk about today and really start that off with kind of posing a question. And that question is, what's going to have the biggest impact uh, on income in your operation? So if you just kind of sit and think about that, you don't have to type the answer in or unmute, but just kind of 
think for a second, and then we'll talk about that and that what that means for our operations and what we want to think about from a management standpoint moving forward. So when we look at income, all right, there's a couple different things that are generate income from the CAF side of things. The biggest one and often the one that's most overlooked is the percentage of those females that we expose to the bull, what percentage of those females ultimately end up weaning a calf, okay? And so we kind of have to think back in time if we're weaning those calves at seven to eight months of age and then we have a nine and a half month gestation, we're talking about having to make sure we have records going 18 months back so we know how many females we expose to the bull and of those exposed females, how many of them we need calf. The higher we can get that number, hopefully we're above 90% would be really good. State average will run somewhere 83 to 85%, depending on what numbers you want to look at. But the higher we can get that, the better. That's going to have the biggest in, impact on income over operation. Sale weight's going to be important, and that's going to be a, a function of that equation and then dollars per hundred weight or dollars per pound. And when we think about income from those calves, it's those three multiplied together. So ultimately the number of calves, what did they weigh and what did they bring per pound? So let's just step back and think a minute, what's gonna be the biggest driver on pregnancy rates and getting those wean calves, but then also getting uh, good weaning weights on those calves. And that's all gonna tie back into uh, the body condition scores of those cows. So just as a reminder, body condition scores get low, pregnancy rates get low. So mature cows, we wanna make sure those cows are in a body condition score five or better for those young females, body condition score of six or better just prior to or at calving to optimize those reproductive rates in those cows. And just as a reminder what that body condition score five cow looks like. So we can't see any ribs on that cow from hooks to pins, she's filled back in with muscle, so we don't have that concave appearance there. We're starting to get some muscle tissue over those bones, but we really don't have any extra fat down in the brisket or definitely no fat bones on that cow there. Don't just get hung up on one spot. I talked to a producer uh, last week that was overestimating cows by a fair bit because he was just looking at ribs and not looking at some other things and and so make sure you look at multiple spots on those cows. Just another body condition score five for you to look at. This one's got a little bit of hair on her but again if we look at her from hooks to pins she's filled back in with muscle there but no excess fat uh, above that by the tail head where those fat pones would be and no extra fat down in the brisket. Now what else is going to impact profitability in our operation? So we've already talked about reproduction and sale price of those animals. Uh, but how is your input cost going to impact your profitability? And it definitely does. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about being a low cost producer. You may read something in a magazine promoting being a low cost producer. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, that statement really frustrates me. I don't want to be a low cost producer. I want to be a higher return on investment producer. Because sometimes if we just get so focused in on being low cost, there's times where if we spend a little bit of money, we could get a really good return on investment on that money. Or maybe we need to spend a little bit of money to make sure we have those cows in appropriate condition to get them bred so we have a calf to sell. So if we just think about being a low cost producer, that can really get us in trouble in a hurry. So really think about what that means from a biology standpoint and what it means from a return on investment standpoint. So if we think about income from cattle that we sell off of our operation, one thing we forget about at times is those cows that are no longer in our breeding herd. And depending on the operation, they can represent 10 to 20% of the annual income for your operation. So we really need to think about those and make sure um, we're selling those in appropriate conditions so we can capture good value on those cows that we're no longer using for breeding purposes and reproduction purposes. When we don't have near as many bulls, those bulls are also generating income. So we need to think about that 
as well uh, when we go to sell in. And then obviously the majority of our income is gonna come from those calves that we're selling. Whether we're selling them as stocker calves, we're selling them as feeder calves, maybe we're participating in some kind of a niche market or maybe we're selling replacement females to other producers. But those calves ultimately are gonna drive the biggest part of income for most operations. Another thing we want to think about when it comes to generating that income is, are we ultimately worried about price per pound? Or are we ultimately worried about dollars per head? And ultimately, I'm going to be worried about dollars per head, not price per pound is important, but there's times where we may get a high price per pound, but it's not overall beneficial in our operation. Maybe because those animals uh, just aren't as big as what they need to be. And so they bring a little bit more per pound, but then we have some bigger ones that bring less per pound, but ultimately enter, end up generating more dollars per head for the operation. So make sure you look at both of those numbers, but really focus in on that dollars per head for the operation. And then we need to think about marketing goals because that's going to have some impact on what we do in the operation. I mentioned replacement females and niche markets earlier. And if that's what you're doing, uh, then price per pound is not important when we're thinking about those, selling those replacement females. We're selling them by the head and we're gonna do some things differently in the management of our operation. And oftentimes our bull selection and those things to generate those females to go to somebody else. Or even if we're buying those females and then developing them and breeding them. We just need to be thinking about what the marketing goals are in our operation so we can really optimize that. We can't have one goal, but then not have a really good outlet for what we're trying to do. That's not going to work. So whatever our goal is, we need to make sure we have a good outlet for that as well. And so when we think about niche marketing, and, and for the most part today, I'm going to focus on traditional cow-calf production and, and marketing those calves through traditional chains. But for those producers who are interested and in, in, uh, have the de desire and the ability, there are some opportunities in niche marketing to capture some more value in some of those animals if it's done correctly, whether that's be local beef production or whether that be grass-fed beef production or something along those lines or, or raisin something that's a little more unique, but you know you have an outlet for it. You can't decide I'm gonna raise this and then not have an outlet for it and expect it to be successful there. So when we think about back to those uh, cows and bulls that we're not using for reproduction purposes anymore, and typically we're gonna to refer to those as market cows and bulls. Uh, a lot of times we think about them as coal cows that's the same thing. It's just those animals we're not using for reproductive purposes anymore. So we'll talk about some marketing uh, avenues for them and then some of the things that affect prices of those animals. And then we'll follow up and do the same for our, our calves also. So when we think about marketing uh, those cows that we're no longer using for reproductive purposes or those bulls we're no longer using for reproductive purposes, your local auction market can be a very good option, especially for those cows that are in good condition um, and strong and don't have any kind of potential lameness issues. Um, those cattle can go across a large part of the, the country uh, to be slaughtered. Uh, a lot of times we assume it's just going to be here in Texas or Oklahoma, but we'll see some of those cattle go into the Midwest and other places. Uh, that are in good shape and can definitely handle those long hauls. So that's an opportunity going through that local auction to expose those animals to more potential buyers out there. There are opportunities to sell those animals direct to some of those um, packing facilities that uh, specialize in packer cows and packer bulls. Uh, Cavanus is one of them, H&B and in, in packing, packing in Waco would be another one as well. And, and then when we're dealing with these, it's important to know, do they have any kind of incentives in place? And so at one point in time, there was a uh, packing cow operation out there that if you could guarantee there wasn't any bird shot or buck shot in those animals and would sign an affidavit to that uh, 
stating that they would actually pay you a premium on those animals. So that's something to take advantage of if you're in that situation to potentially generate some more uh, value out of those animals. A lot of times, if you will agree to deliver those animals either right before or right after the Christmas holidays, especially because we typically shut down auction markets for a couple weeks, there, there can be some premiums paid on those cattle because of being delivered at that time of year. So if you're looking at selling direct, just be aware of that and take advantage of it. For a lot of that, you're gonna be need to dealing in truckload lots, which would be basically a 48,000 to 50,000 pound load there. Um, a lot of times you're looking at about 30 uh, to 35 cows, depending on the weight. But if you have that ability, there are some options to potentially take advantage of there as well. And then maybe there's some animals that just don't fit your operation for whatever reason, but there, there's no reason they couldn't be good reproductive animals for other producers out there. Then you may look at selling those animals private treaty. Uh, one of the online uh, options that gets used by a lot of people is a website called The Cattle Range where you can list those animals for sale. Uh, you don't pay any commission on them until those animals are sold and only if they're sold from that website. Uh, or, you know, there, there's other options or two, but that's gonna be one of the most common ones. So just look at ways to capture uh, additional value out of those market cows, and market bulls. So we're gonna be some of the things that affect the price of those animals. Obviously, if they're going back into production for somebody else, they're in a different category. But if we think about those that are going back into beef production, uh, are going to be produced or going to be harvested for beef, I should say. Uh, there's a range in price we'll see on those animals. And so some of you may be familiar with this. This is uh, the weekly price trends graph that I put together. And then you can sign up at the beeffacts.timu.edu website um, to get this. And this is the average of the high and low price reported for packer cows from six uh, auction markets, uh, three in the Central Texas area and three in the East Texas area. And you can see those prices fluctuate throughout the year. Obviously, um, we have some COVID impacts going back here uh, the spring of, of last year. And we'll look at some, some traditional seasonality as well. But you see that variation in price we have over time. The other big thing hopefully you're seeing is the prices between kind of the low prices reported and high prices reported. And we can easily have a 30 to $35 difference uh, per hundred weight there. So if you're just talking about a cow that's weighing uh, 1,200 pounds and there's a $30 difference, we're talking about $360 difference per head there. And we'll talk about some of the things that make up that difference. But to get those better prices, we need those cows in good shape. So typically that means a body condition score of four to six, uh, no major lameness issues or any other kind of defect issues on. Now, the other thing I should point out here is sometimes you may uh, have been in a situation where you say, well, I saw some of them sell less for this price. And if there's some higher risk ones that they're worried about, being rejected at the plant by the inspectors, those animals are definitely gonna bring less. And we wanna make sure we market those animals long before they get into that potential situation. But a huge amount of value difference throughout the year between those more desirable or those higher yielding animals and those lower yielding animals. When we think about seasonality, and this is a old slide, but everything still holds true and it, it illustrates this really well, uh, is typically we'll see the highest prices in the spring, February and March for the most part, the last 10 years or so. This year, those prices have held on. We're still at uh, near seasonal high or at seasonal high prices right now, even into the middle of April. And when we think about it, it's a supply and demand situation. We just see less of those cows coming to market in the spring than what we do in the fall. And you can see in the fall, those prices are gonna be low. And you say, well, why is that? Well, there's a couple of things. One, the majority of calves in the United States are gonna be born in the spring. And so if that's the case, 
you know, those cows are going to have calves on them and producers typically aren't looking at selling them at that point in time. And so when we wean that calf in the fall, a lot of cows are coming to town because that producer had been planning on culling that animal, but now it's weaned a calf, they're ready to go ahead and cull it. And sometimes they probably would have been better off if they would have culled it sooner. But that's one reason we see more of them come to town in the fall just due to our calving seasons. And then also thinking about the cost of carrying that cow through the winter and people are looking not to have to do that. So it's a supply and demand situation. And then also if we think about the entire United States and when most people are outside grilling, we're going to have a whole lot more of that in the spring and in the summer than we would into the winter. So that plays into that demand equation. So a combination of supply and demand. So spring high prices, fall low prices when we're talking about packer cows and packer bulls. So when we look at some of the things that are specifically going to impact the value of those animals, how much yield, how many pounds of meat can they get out of those animals? So if we look at a really small frame, lightweight animal here, it costs the same for the packing plant to process this animal as it does a larger size cow. And so they're going to discount this one more because they're not going to get near as much yield out of it. Obviously cows that are way, way too thin. We're just not gonna get much beef off of those. And so they're gonna be discounted tremendously. There's no reason we should have any of these body condition score one cows out there. We should have done something uh, much sooner, either from a health management standpoint, working with their veterinarian, or from a culling strategy standpoint to move those animals on down the road long before they got into this kind of condition. We look at a body condition three cow. This is still lower than, than what's ideal for that packer cow and packer bull market. Uh, just don't have near as much meat, even though we have more than the previous cow, just not as much meat to sell there. So really we're looking at a body condition score four to six is kind of ideal for that packer cow market. Those cows that are really, really fat are gonna get discounted uh, because again, they're looking for that uh, meat there and they're not looking for that fat because they don't have a market for all that fat. So those overly fat cows will get discounted as well. The other things we want to think about is some of the defects that we can get into and that can have some additional implications. So if we're dealing with something like cancer eye, anytime you see that little bit of cancer eye, you either want to look at getting that immediately treated or going ahead and getting that animal marketed. If she's sitting there and you see a cow like this that has that little spot and she's got a two month old calf on her, you say, well, I'm gonna wait till that calf is you know, seven, eight months old and then mark her there. On some of those, they can progress very rapidly. And so don't wait, we need to do that uh, very early on in that process. Because if it gets to something like this, that animal's just not gonna have any value at that point in time. And, th and that's not what we need for the industry in any form or fashion. So now when we think about marketing channels for our stocker and our feeder calves, um, and again, thinking about that traditional market and really not niche markets at this point in time, is again, thinking back to our, our local weekly auction. There's a lot of them out there and there's some options there, um, but you probably aren't taking advantage of some things we could definitely do just from a simple precondition standpoint to capture more value in those calves. Um, so I mentioned preconditioning. And so when we think about preconditioning calves, uh, historically we've thought about weaning those calves 45 days plus two rounds of vaccines, generally speaking, and then we market them. Uh, and that's still the case with one exception is most preconditioned calf cells have moved to a 60 day weaning period. So just be aware of that uh, in case your preconditioned cell has changed or if you're looking at exploring that. But when we look at the value of participating in a preconditioned calf cell, it can be extremely beneficial from a couple standpoints. Um, one is if you take those vaccinated and weaned calves through the weekly regular auction and you're the only one that has calves like that there, 
you're not going to see any price difference for those compared to the uncastrated, unvaccinated calves, just because there's not enough of them for those buyers to put them together uh, to pay that premium for them. There is definitely a premium for those calves. So you, you need to market them through a preconditioned calf sale so we can take advantage of that. And there's uh, two of the probably longest running ones in the state is one of them is the net bio sale up at Sulphur Springs. That's a picture of it here. And they'll have uh, numerous of those sales throughout the year. They've actually added a couple here the last couple of years because they've had such a demand uh, for people wanting to put calves in those sales. Um, if you're curious about it and kind of want to see how that works and how those prices would compare uh, to some other options. That sale is broadcast live on the internet. So if you'll go to this Sulphur Springs Livestock Auction webpage, you can get the, the links there to actually watch that live uh, and, and see that sale go. When we look at preconditioning, some people are hesitant because they say it costs money to precondition kids. And it does, but probably not near as much as what you think or, or what it has to. Sometimes we spend some money in places where we really don't need to. So when we think about vaccinating those calves, uh, depending on what kind of volume and exactly which products we're buying, we're looking at typically somewhere between about 7 and $12 per calf to get that done. Uh, from a feeding standpoint, that's where a lot of producers can get in trouble in a hurry of spending too much on a feeding program. Ideally, the way we want to do that is wean those calves on grass. Uh, Fallborn calves that we're weaning in typically May, uh, we got late spring and summer grass to turn those calves on. If we think about weaning those calves in the fall, we can actually, if we do stockpile forage right, you can wean those calves on stockpiled forage in the fall and get along real well with them. So we need to do as much of that on grass as possible and then just supplement if that forage uh, is really deficient because we need to keep those calves growing, but we don't need to try to put a tremendous amount of weight on them. So I'm going to tell you, I would like to see them gain in somewhere uh, between about uh, three quarters of a pound and a pound and a quarter a day. That way we keep those calves on a positive plane of nutrition. We allow that immune system to really prime up and get working good, but we don't spend a lot of extra money and feed cost on those calves. Uh, so we wanna, wanna think about that. When we look at the value of those preconditioned calves, if you just look at the vaccine uh, and the weaning component of that, a lot of times you're looking at six to eight uh, six to ten dollars per head depending on the situation and the time of year and the value of calves. But another benefit of that that isn't always readily apparent is when we participate in these preconditioned calf sales because of the number of animals there that they can put similar types and kinds in groups together we'll actually get an additional premium that I would refer to as a truckload lock premium. And so if we look at selling calves individually through a sale or we're selling groups that can be put into truckload lots of similarly managed and similar type calves, we get that truckload lot premium and that, that can be pretty significant. So when we think about the preconditioning pro, uh, premium and the, the truckload lot premium, depending on the type of calves you have and, and where you're comparing them to, you can be looking at additional 70 to $100 uh, per head per calf in those situations through a good preconditioning calf sale. Now it has to be one that has a good reputation. Uh, there, there's there's been some that didn't have the best reputation over the years. If you show up to a preconditioned calf sale and you hear calves bawling in the back, that's not a good sign. Those buyers know that, and so they're not going to pay the same. Uh, they're not going to pay a preconditioned premium for those calves. They're going to treat them like unweaned. Uh, calves that are just coming through a, a weekly auction. So you do have to make sure you, you're using a preconditioned calf sale that's holding people, producers accountable and doing things right and, and have a good reputation. Another benefit that we get from those preconditioned calf sales that's not always really apparent is shrink. And so if we look at an unweaned calf, those calves can easily shrink 
uh, 8 to 12, 8 to 15 percent very easily, depending on the time of the year. If we look at a preconditioned calf sale, we can cut that down to a 2 to 5 percent, depending on the situation. If you send them in there and get them back on feed for 48 hours before they weigh them, uh, typically those calves will end up weighing the same as what they were when they left the ranch. And so then you're just looking at that 2 percent pencil shrink they typically put on. So a lot of good options and avenues there. Make sure you explore that and see if that's something that would work for your operation. If you have the ability to sell truckload lots of calves, and again, we're talking 48 to 50,000 pounds, then video auction through somebody like Superior is a really good option for you and something that you can look at and consider uh, there. Some people are interested in selling those calves directly. And so having somebody come out to the farm and buy those calves, uh, there's several different order buyers or, around the state that will do that. It's just important that you make sure you know where the market is uh, and you trust that who's ever coming out there and buying me there, you trust that they're gonna tell you exactly where the market is and not try to buy those calves quite a bit cheaper or make sure you, you know where they're at. Uh, that can work well and in other situations, not so well. So you really need to be on top of things. And then there's always a situation you can retain ownership of those calves. So sometimes producers feel like they're just not getting a fair price for those calves if they're trying to sell them as stockers or feeders. So you always have the option of retaining ownership of those animals through the feedlot and selling them uh, coming out of the feedlot uh, at the packing level. Um, if you have, if you can put a hundred head together of a similar type and kind, then the panhandle is an option for you. If you need to go in much, much smaller groups than the South Texas yards, a lot of times they'll feed smaller groups of even potentially uh, 10 to 20 calves in those situations. So that is another option if, if you're not happy with the other marketing avenues out there. So when we think about some of the factors affecting the selling price of these calves, again, timing is a huge issue, just like we talked about supply and demand when we talked about the packer cows and the, the packer bulls, uh, same thing when we talk about calves. And so if we look at the calf prices, and again here, this is that weekly cattle price trends graph I put out with the blue line showing you uh, the highest price reported across those six markets for three to 400 pound calves. So really the highest price is gonna be for that lighter weight calf, that 300 pound calf from a four to five. So again, about a 400 pound calf there and then a greater than 500 pound. So that, that would be a, a 500 pound steer roughly because as the weight of those animals increase, price per pound decreases. That's that slide we talk about from time to time. So you can see we've had a very, lot of variation uh, in the market the last year. Uh, we'll look at some more traditional seasonal patterns here in a minute, but quite a bit of variation the last year. And even here two weeks ago, we saw a, a really unusual spike um, in these calves weighing more than 500 pounds. And then we saw them drop back down to where they were uh, the previous week there. And, say, well, what's going on there? And I actually went back and double checked the market report after um, my support staff person entered them because it's like, that's a big jump. But every one of the, the six markets all had that same jump. And so what that tells me is somebody had an order they needed to get filled most likely. And so they were paying a little bit more that week uh, to get those calves of that particular uh, weight range bought for whatever reason, because you see we really didn't see that when we looked at those other calves, and that would be really unusual to see that big jump, but those, those things happen in the market from time to time. But what we would typically expect when we're talking about like a five to 600 pound calf, the spring of the year, April, May, is typically going to be the highest. The fall of the year, September, October, is typically going to be the lowest because we have so many of those calves being uh, weaned at that point in time and sold in the fall since most 
uh, cows in the U.S. are going to be calved in late winter, springtime. Colors, one, people get obsessed about probably more than what they need to. And part of it depends a little bit where you're marketing those animals. If you're going through a weekly uh, auction market where you're selling those calves one at a time, if you can get a black or a charlet colored animal, those a lot of times do tend to do a little bit better in that market from the standpoint that there's more of them of those colors that those buyers can get those groups put together and, and match them up a little bit better. That doesn't mean a red calf isn't valuable, but to capture that value, you really got to have more of them put together. And when we're selling them in truckload lots, they'll bring just as much or more as the black calves or the Charlet colored calves will. When we start getting into some of our off-colored cattle, definitely those cattle are going to be discounted. But again, if we can get more of them put together, a lot of times that discount is not near as severe in that situation, depending on just how much color, unique color patterns we have. So if we look at these calves in, in this top picture, those calves typically won't be uh, but a couple dollars back in that situation when we're selling a group of them. Now these Longhorn influence calves down here, they're going to be discounted uh, pretty severely, but at least if you got more of them together there, it won't be quite uh, as much in most situations. And typically we think about stripes not being very good. And from a steer standpoint, that's the case. But if your market is to sell replacement heifers, there's definitely some value in those F1 tiger stripe females. So the color deal, we can have some sex implications there if we're talking about the potential of replacement females at times. Perceived breed type has a big impact, and that's the key word there is perceived breed type. Uh, not necessarily what, uh, if, if we knew the background and pedigree would show, but if we're looking at those calves, what do they appear to look like? So if we think about our British breeds, and just as a reminder, those would be Red Angus, Hereford, Angus, and then Shorthorn would be our British breeds. If we think about our continental breeds, we're thinking about things like Charlet, Simmental, Limousine, Gelby being some of the main ones. And then when we think about our Boss Indicus breeds or American breeds, we're thinking about Brahmin, Santa Gertrudis, uh, Beefmaster, Simbra, Brangus, Brayford, those, those breeds there. So if we think about a calf that's going to appeal to a large number of buyers out there, and that's what we need to maximize the value on those calves is we need the more people we can have bidding on them, the better off we're going to be or the more people we have interested in buying. them. So to avoid significant discounts, you may not always top the market, but to avoid significant discounts, we want to make sure those calves have at least a quarter British, no more than a half continental, no more than a quarter Brahmin influence or a longhorn in those calves. And so there's a lot of ways we can reach those targets and still have cows that really fit our environment. So one option there is if you like Brangus cows, we could use a Brangus cow and put a Charlet bull back on her for an example there. And in that situation, we would have a calf that's 5 16 British. So at least that quarter we were talking about. It's only a half continental, so we haven't exceeded that target and then less than a quarter Brahmin influence there. Obviously we could put several different breeds on that Brangus type cow and, and, and get those same type of percentages. That's just one example there. Uh, we could look at using an Angus bull back on an F1 cow if you liked F1 cows and get something that was still very desirable from a market standpoint. So weight of those animals, um, I already mentioned the slide and it's, it's gonna vary some, but the lighter weight animals will bring more money per pound than the heavier weight animals. And that's gonna be influenced on how much that slide is, depending on what cost of gain in the feedlot is. So the higher the cost of gain in the feedlot is, the more willing that feedlot is to pay more for those heavier weight cattle so they don't have to put more weight on them. If cost of gain is low, they just assume buy those lighter weight calves 
and uh, have them in the feedlot longer and put more weight on them because they can do it cheaper. So weight of the animal will have some impact. And we'll talk about that a little more later when we talk about value of gain. Muscle and frame of those animals. So we need to make sure those animals have some muscle shape and expression to them. They don't have to be super heavy muscle by any means, but you kind of want uh, an average or better uh, from a muscling standpoint. So they have a little bit of shape and expression there. And then from a frame size standpoint, we want to make sure those calves would be considered either moderate or large frame. The smaller frame calves will take a discount compared to those uh, moderate or large frame animals. Just showing that a little more extreme here. Uh, if you look at these kind of two steers in the back, a large, moderate, we're small here, but then we're super small here. And these calves are even gonna take a greater discount in that kind of situation. So just be aware of those kind of things when you're making your breeding decisions. When we think about management practices that can affect the value and selling price of those calves we have, castration is a big one. That's going to be worth anywhere from five to ten dollars per hundred weight, depending on the time of the year and that size of calves we're dealing with. Uh, so even if you're just talking about five dollars for a 500 pound calf, that's twenty five dollars that you can generate just by castrating that calf, not to mention it's the right thing to do from an industry standpoint and a welfare standpoint to castrate that animal at as young of an age as possible if they're not gonna be used for breeding purposes or potential breeding purposes. Even if you had to pay somebody to come in and castrate those calves, you could still come out uh, ahead in that situation. Dehorning, there is a little bit of value uh, in that a lot of times we're looking at maybe a dollar or two for 100 weight, we may even see that grow moving forward because of some of the requirements and some of the branded beef programs. Ideally, we would like to dehorn those calves through genetic means using polled or homozygous polled bulls in that situation would be best. I will tell you, I'm aware of at least one branded beef program that they're in their specifications it states that at the feedlot level, they can't do anything that would create blood on that animal from even like tipping horns. Um, so those animals, even with the little horns, there wouldn't be something that that particular program would be interested in buying. It wouldn't surprise me if we see more programs moving forward that has those kind of suspects. So just be aware of that, especially when you're making uh, bull selection decisions moving forward. If, if you have the ability to use some pole bulls uh, that can really have some benefits uh, there on multiple levels. Other factors, anytime calves are extremely full, you know, they have a real big belly full of feed and water, that's gonna reduce price a little bit. On the flip side of that, if they're extremely shrunk in, it may make them look like they bring a little bit more per pound but when you think about all that weight that was given up, you'd be a whole lot better off to have them in a normal field standpoint at a couple of dollar back of the, what those extremely shrunken calves, you would generate more dollars per head. The other thing is those calves that are extremely fleshy tend to get discounted. So you gotta be very careful of supplementing those calves from a creep feeding standpoint too much. Uh, and typically creep feeding just doesn't pay and we'll talk about that. Uh, as far as free choice creep feeding goes anyway, but you don't want to get those calves too fleshy because they will get discounted there. That's another benefit of those preconditioned calf programs is it can help get those calves in appropriate flesh if they're coming off the cow a little bit more fleshy than what those buyers would typically uh, like to have. There's a lot of branded programs out there. Most of them you have to have a truckload lot to participate in. But if you do have that, there's a lot of those that you can um, follow those requirements and potentially get some more value for those calves. One of them that you may see if you watch the Superior Livestock Auction Zone RFD TV or the Northern Video Auction Zone RFD TV, you'll see NHTC, which just stands for non-hormone treated cattle, meaning we haven't given them an implant and those cattle can be eligible for export to certain countries. 
there's some paperwork requirements and again some affidavits and stuff you have to sign there but but that is an option another one you'll see is the gap or good animal practices and they actually have different levels to that but those are things if you are selling in truckload lots that you may want to take a look at to try to generate some uh, increased value on those calves. And then just to kind of wrap up some other things we can look at doing to increase income from the operation. A huge one is reducing shrink. The more we reduce that shrink, the more pounds we have to sell. And typically that just has to do with some management things and some timing things. So. Weaning those calves is huge from a shrink standpoint. A weaned calf is not gonna shrink near as much as an unweaned calf. If we look at, um, if you're unable to wean those calves for whatever reason and you, and you need to sell them directly off the cow, you wanna make sure you minimize the amount of time between when they come off the cow and when they walk through that cell ring. What you wanna avoid doing is taking that calf and putting it in a dry lot overnight and then hauling it to the sale the next day. And then when we think about handling cattle, you know, we want to keep those cattle as quiet and calm as we can when we're handling them. If they get excited, they're going to urinate and defecate more. And so we're going to see more shrink there. Plus they're going to be slower to go back to feed and water. So we'll see more shrink. So a lot of different things we can do to, to really help us from a shrink standpoint. I mentioned value of gain, and this is something I want to spend a little bit of time on here because it's something to uh, a lot of people don't understand on the surface, but has a huge impact on what we need to do, especially when we think about supplementing cattle and, and what that additional weight is worth. And so if we think about value of gain, just working through this example, if we had two steers and we were getting ready to, to sell those and we're selling them at the same time. And let's just say that 500 pound steer bringing $1.60, he's worth $800. A 560 pound steer uh, worth $1.51, so he's worth $845.60. What's that additional weight worth? So if we're trying to make the decision, were we going to try to feed those calves so that we put an extra 60 pounds on them so we were selling this, this heavier steer? Is that additional 60 pounds, is it worth a buck 60? Is it worth a buck 51 or is it worth something else? Okay. And a lot of people on the surface would just say a buck 51. And you'll even see some advertisements from some companies out there that calculate this incorrectly because it looks better for them if they calculate it incorrectly. But the way we want to do that is we want to look at how much did we change the weight of that calf? So we put 60 pounds on it. So we changed weight 60 pounds there. How much did we change value per head? So 845 minus 800 told me we increased the value of that calf by $45.60. So then we can take that value increase divided by the weight change. And that tells us each additional pound of gain in this situation is worth about 76 cents. So anything we do to try to put more weight on that calf, especially from a supplementation standpoint, if it costs us more than 76 cents in this situation, we're losing money, okay? Uh, I will tell you a good value of gain number to figure most of the time is somewhere about 75 to 80, maybe 85 cents uh, in that range. Uh, so be aware of that when you're making those decisions. So there's a lot of times people call me and they'll, they'll want to supplement those calves in that preconditioning program. They can get them to gain two pounds a day or two and a half pounds a day versus a, a pound a day. And I'll tell them, well, based on your feed costs and those things, I wouldn't recommend that because it's going to cost more than that value of gain. And these are the calculations I'm, I'm making in my head when, when we're looking at that to, to make those decisions. Now we'll tell you one thing we wanna be mindful of uh, this year, if corn prices continue to stay higher, that anytime corn prices are high, which means cost of gain in the feedlot is gonna be higher, value of gain increases, meaning feedlots would rather us as cow-calf producers or stocker producers to put more weight on those calves on grass before they buy them. So there's a potential we may see that value of gain go up this year. And so if you have the grass, the more weight you could put on them 
with grass even, even better for you in that situation. On the flip side, when corn gets really, really cheap, value of gain goes down, and that tells us selling those lighter weight calves are typically more in our favor. The other thing is selling stocker steers versus feeder steers, selling those heavier animals when we're talking about that 758, 850, even 900 pounds, there can definitely be some advantages there and, and we can capture some more value. Now, the big thing is if you're gonna be trying to sell anything over about 700 pounds, you really need to make sure you probably have a preconditioned calf sale to sell those into to capture that value because if you just take them to the local weekly market and there's only a handful of those heavier calves there, um, a lot of times they get discounted in that situation. So be aware of that. Another thing to be aware of if you decide to go from the weights you typically sell those calves at and hold them longer to put more weight on them from a grass standpoint, you're likely gonna need to reduce your cow numbers. Uh, so, so be aware of that. Don't try to hold those calves longer plus keep the same number of cows unless it's a year where we got plenty of extra rainfall and extra grass. Um, another thing that building it into your plan to fill, uh, sell those feeder steers is, it can really help from a drought management standpoint because if you get in a situation like we may be getting in to this year, uh, instead of taking those calves to heavier weights and selling them at eight or 850 or even 900 pounds, we can go ahead and sell them at 600 pounds and save some forage to have some more forage left over for the cow herd in those situations. Um, implants is something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot anymore, but there's still definitely value in implanting those calves. Typically we wanna do it about hundred days before we get ready to market those calves. Um, you're looking at a pretty good return on investment a lot of times there. Uh, when we're thinking about a nursing calf, uh, an additional 15 to 25 pounds on weaning weight. When we think about that stocker calf, depending on plane of nutrition, we're probably looking at 20 to even 30 pounds of additional weight gain from that implant. Now, a lot of people ask, well, what if I sell those calves as natural? There may be some value to not implanting them, but you need to make sure that value offsets the weight gain you would have given up by not implanting those calves. That's kind of where I wanted to end tonight. Hopefully that kind of gives you some additional thoughts and ideas on how to market those calves and capture some additional value out of them. If you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box or unmute and just go ahead and ask those questions at this time. So any questions anybody has. Okay, so a question came in, what is a good source to reply to buy replacement cattle, heifers and bulls? Uh, so if we're thinking about replacement heifers, um, there's a couple options for you. Uh, private treaty is one of the more common ones. And one of the easiest places to do that is through that cattle range website that I mentioned earlier. Uh, people re will re list open replacement heifers, they'll list bred females, they'll list pairs and those kind of things. And you can look and see what's out there. Um, several auction markets at certain times of the year, oftentimes in the spring, and then typically again, um, right before Christmas, they'll have an end of the year special replacement female sales. Um, that's a good place to look as well. Not necessarily the weekly market, but unless you know it's a dispersal of somebody, because otherwise chances are somebody's culling that animal for a reason, unless it's a, a drought situation. Um, Jordan Cattle Company out at San Saba will have about 10 special replacement female sales a year. They actually have one coming up this Saturday uh, they will broadcast that online so you can set it at your house and, and kind of see what prices are for different females or even buy some off the internet if you want to. We see more and more of that these days. When it comes to bulls, uh, the best place there generally is going to be at a bull sale or private treaty from a breeder who's developing bulls. Depending on what breed of bull you're interested in, I would recommend contacting the Breed Association. 
um, and they can give you the names of some breeders uh, in your area that you may want to visit about uh, when we're looking at bulls. A huge thing on bulls is don't buy bulls with the unknown reproductive history, especially uh, from a trick standpoint there. So typically that means when we're buying bulls, we're looking at buying virgin bulls that haven't ever been exposed to cows there. All right, well, I think not seeing any additional questions, I think we'll go ahead and call it an end to the program tonight and everybody have a good evening.